Hello, my name is Jim Turk. I'm the director of the Center for Free Expression at Ryerson University. I would like to begin today's session by acknowledging that the land on which I am speaking to you today is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewas, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. I also acknowledge that Toronto uh, is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit <clears throat> and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. On behalf of the Center for Free Expression and our co-sponsors for today's event, which are the Edmonton Public Library, the uh, Milton Public Library, the Tr Thunder Bay Public Library, and the Toronto Public Library, I want to welcome you to the first in the Center for Free Expression's newest series, entitled Taming Big Tech, Exploring the Alternatives. Our conversation today features Corey Doctorow, and the title he has chosen is How to Destroy Surveillance Capitalism, Seizing the Means of Computation. Corey is a, an award-winning science fiction novelist, nonfiction writer, blogger, journalist, and technology advocate. Uh, he works for the Electronic Frontier Foundation, is an MIT Media Lab research affiliate, is a, a visiting professor of computer science at the Open University, and is a visiting professor of practice at the University of North Carolina School of Library and Information Science, and co-founded the UK Open Rights Group. He was born in Toronto and now lives in Los Angeles, where he's from where he's joining us today. Welcome, Corey. Hi, nice to be here. Well, we're glad you could be here. Corey will be joined in our con in conversation today by Andrew Clement. Andrew is a professor emeritus in the Faculty of Information at the University of Toronto, uh, where he coordinates the Information uh, Policy Research Program and co-founded the Identity, Privacy, and Security Institute. With a PhD in computer science, Andrew has had longstanding research and teaching interests in the social implications of information communication technologies and participatory design. Welcome, Andrew. Good to be here. Uh, for today's program, uh, Andrew and Corey will be in conversation. After about 45, 50, 55 minutes of conversation with Corey, Andrew will turn to the audience to bring you into the discussion. As you listen to their conversation, if you have a question at any point uh, that you would like addressed, uh, you can just enter it uh, clicking on the Q&A button. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. Just click on that and write out the question that you would like to be asked. And when Andrew turns to the audience for questions, he'll call on Ange Holmes, who's the coordinator for the Center for Free Expression, uh, to read out each question uh, in sequence. Um, and please just write them as you think of. Don't wait till they turn to the audience to post your questions. Um, so now it's time to hear from Andrew and Corey. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And uh, welcome to all of those out in Zoom land, wherever you may be. Um, I'm reaching you from my home in Canada's west coast in the unceded territory and ancestral homelands of the Tsawat Nation and other Salish peoples in what is now known as British Columbia. As the first of three events in this series, Taming Big Tech, Exploring the Alternatives, I'd like to give a sense of the series and, and why I'm delighted to kick it off by talking with Corey Doctorow about his recent book, How to Destroy Surveillance Capitalism. Uh, the past few years have seen a remarkable shift from avid embrace to widespread skepticism of the big tech enterprises that have become an integral part of daily life for so many of us. Um, Recall 2017, those particularly in Toronto will recall the politicians at every level of the Canadian government enthusiastically welcoming Canada, uh, Google's uh, vision for remaking urban living uh, through the Sidewalk Labs project. That seems unthinkable now. In 2019, Zuboff's book, In the Age of Surveillance Capitalism, crystallized many of the concerns and named the problem in a way that has resonated um, uh, uh, till this day in terms of providing a, uh, a, a handy term, surveillance capitalism for the debate around our, our digital future. 
Um, this past year, a group of us researchers in participatory design concerned about the deleterious aspects of big text dominance joined the fray by publishing a statement we entitled Defund Big Tech, Refund Community, Antitrust is Not Enough, Another Tech is Possible. It provides the inspiration for this Taming Big Tech series in which we'll examine the role of big tech from various perspectives and explore a range of approaches for redirecting the trajectory of technological development so we can better shape our digital futures. To launch this series, who better than Corey Doctorow? Uh, Corey is well known as, a, as an imaginative uh, science fiction writer uh, who thinks about the future in, in uh, remarkably astute and uh, imaginative ways, but he's also a digital rights activist who lives his values, notably in the areas of open and participatory culture. So he combines a vivid imagination with technological savvy and deep commitment to progressive values. Corey's most recent book, How to Destroy Surveillance Capitalism, is an insightful, engaging read and stiff uh, antidote to technological hype. It builds on Zuboff's work while de departing from it in interesting ways. Corey, you've provided much rich material for a conversation on this topic and food for thought. So uh, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, I am delighted to be here. It's always a pleasure to talk to uh, people in Canada and a, re and a refreshing one. Uh, since we're doing stolen land acknowledgements, I'm speaking to you from Los Angeles County, aka land that was stolen with only the most tissue thin rubric of any kind of normality or regularness from the Tongva people who are still around and um, we stole it from them and it doesn't seem like we're going to give it back to them anytime soon. Okay, yes. So let, let's um, start with some of the, the, the basics, uh, taking your destroying uh, surveillance capitalism um, as the base. Um, what do you mean by surveillance capitalism? And what's that? What's its relationship to, to big tech? Well, you know, the, the term surveillance capitalism, it originates out where you are, a bunch of British Columbia academics who edited a, a journal uh, special issue about the role that surveillance was playing in uh, new forms of capitalism. And they, they came at it with a fairly market skeptical perspective uh, and, um, and were, I think, effectively arguing that um, left to its own capitalism will engage in activities that are likely to uh, be frowned upon by other market participants, but if they can get away with it, they will. And the term was then popularized by an academic, you mentioned her, Shoshana Zuboff, who had a very different view on what surveillance capitalism what amounted to. Zuboff, I think, is less market skeptical. She's a business professor. And uh, she takes the view that when you add surveillance to computation, that you can do stuff to influence people's behavior in such a way that markets stop working. That if the, if the function of a market is to aggregate a bunch of otherwise uncapturable decisions about what people are willing to pay, what they want, uh, and then to create these efficient allocations through uh, a kind of emergent process, right, a, of, a, of a big multi-agent simulation that produces this, these, these, um, uh, good, um, uh, these good allocations, that if you don't get to choose freely, right, if, if instead you're, you're being guided in your choice by uh, psychological manipulation, then you cease to have a market. It becomes something more like a command economy. And I break with Zuboff's view of, of this. I am much more sympathetic to the original definition um, that the reason that companies spy is not because they really figured out how to do anything particularly great with our data, but, but rather because they've convinced themselves that if they get enough of it, uh, they will someday crack the puzzle of how to manipulate us. And that the one group of people they figured out how to really reliably manipulate is advertisers, whom they have convinced that uh, they've really hit on something here, that they, can, that they can do what amounts to mind control by taking a bunch of data from people non-consensually, running it through a bunch of machine learning algorithms and spitting out just the, the right way to whisper in your ear so that you go out and buy a refrigerator. You know, it, it boils down to, you know, Google made a mind control ray to sell your nephew a fidget spinner and then Robert Mercer stole it and made your uncle a QAnon racist. 
and and I'm skeptical of that claim. I, I the place where I align very closely with Zuboff is in the idea that tech has an enormous control over our lives. And I think the reason that it has enormous control over our lives is because it has uh, acquired monopolies, but not through any kind of mystical technical process involving network effects and, and first mover advantages, but rather through the, the dismal straightforward way that monopolies are generally formed, something Canadians are very familiar with, which is just uh, mergers to monopoly acquisitions, you know, see also Ted Rogers. Uh, and that um, these, these runaway acquisitions have produced a web consisting of five giant websites filled with screenshots of the other four. And it forecloses on our ability to choose. It, it does make a command economy, right? That we don't have a market in fixing iPhones because Apple has figured out how to use copyright law to make it a crime to fix iPhones beyond the way that they want you to fix iPhones. And we don't have you know, a real market for search because Google has figured out how to buy its way to the front of the line for search reliably across all, uh, um, across all platforms. You know, it's the one deal that Sundar Pinchai and, and Tim Cook do every year in person they sit down and figure out how much, how many billions of dollars Apple is going to are going to get from Google for making Google the official search, and you know Facebook has figured out how to um, trick us all into a mutual hostage taking where I'm on Facebook because you're there and you're on Facebook because I'm there and neither of us like it very much but we're both stuck, and that's a thing that we should really worry about in, in particular if we worry about self-determination, whether we worry about self-determination because we think it's intrinsic to human dignity or because we worry about self-determination because the ability to choose freely creates this efficient market allocation or both, that's the thing we should worry about. And we can talk about this more. I, I mean, I can go on and on, but you know, I wanna close this answer by saying Zuboff is pretty dismissive of the idea that, that this is a monopoly problem. And to the extent that it is a monopoly, she thinks it's a monopoly that's driven by the ability to determine behavioral outcomes and not the absolutely normal market process of anti-competitively buying your competitors so that, they, so that you don't face competition. And um, you know, I, I like to analogize our two views to uh, a kind of two different science fiction plots, right? Uh, there's the one science fiction plot where there's a giant planetary destroying comet hurtling towards the Earth. And we decide that we need to solve that by getting on that comet and steering it, right? Steering it away from the Earth. You know, Bruce Willis and his pals go up there with a big jet engine to move the comet, maybe harness it for human thriving. Uh, and then there's the other version, which is that the comet is heading towards the Earth. And the reason it's, a, it's an existential risk is because it's so damn big. And so there's a different version where Bruce Willis and his friends go up there with like a nuke to pulverize the comet so that it just burns up and makes uh, an interesting light show as it burns up in the atmosphere. And depending on who you believe, trusting one instead of the other is a disaster, right? If you think that you can't blow the comet up into pieces small enough that it disappears harmlessly into the atmosphere and, and instead will become a killing rain of meteors that wipe out every city, then you definitely don't wanna break the, media, the comet up. And, and if you think that there's no way we can steer it, if you think that steering it is a fool's errand, then all you're going to do is, is give it a, a co-pilot to sit on the meteor, hammering futilely at the controls that they've installed while it barrels towards the earth to destroy it. And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm in the let's break the comet up school and Zuboff is in the no, that will destroy us all because all you'll do is diffuse the power to control our minds. And that's where this sharp division emerges. Yeah. Well, that's um, vividly put <laughs> as, a, as, a, as, a, as a choice. What, what a choice we have. Um, but I think there's, there's maybe more agreement, um, and it's relevant here, uh, between you and, and Zuboff about the question of how big tech and its surveillance uh, business model and, and data techniques um, can influence the behavior of people, not by a mind control ray, which um, you attribute to, to, uh, to, to Zuboff, uh, which I, I share skepticism with, but, the, but some of the things that you talk about in, in your, your book about how um, selection and targeting and tracking and aggregation and, all, and finding, you know, helping you find other people who think like you do and so reinforce your, 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 your sense of, 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 of 
you know, rightness and, and can mobilize action and so on. All those are, are important aspects of influencing individual and collective behavior that don't require um, this mind control ray. So, so wouldn't you ag agree that there, there is, um, there's a, a be behavioral shaping, um, you know, you know, damaging in many ways um, aspect of, of this that needs to be kept in the picture here? So I, I, I do, but I think that there's a very important if subtle distinction. So, so take, for example, um, the, the best peer-reviewed evidence we have uh, for the ability of, of the firms to control our, our, our behavior directly. Uh, so, you know, independent scholarly work. So, so Facebook did a non-consensual psychological experiment on 60 million Facebook users, where they exposed them to messages that they predicted would incentivize more of them to vote than you would expect uh, uh, in, uh, otherwise. And, that, and they had a control arm so they could, they could actually see whether they saw more of a, a turnout. And they did it in the you know, run up to an election. And what they saw was that about 300,000 people went out and voted that they didn't expect to vote, which sounds like a really big number. Uh, it sounds like a really big number particularly because we've had so many close shave elections. But here's the thing, it's 0.39%. So this is across all precincts in which they made the intervention. They haven't figured out how to get 200,000 people who live in Willowdale to go out and vote, right? Or in, you know, North Calgary. They figured out how to get 0.34% or 0.39% more people than you would expect to turn out. And as close as our elections are, they're not that close. And there's some other important glosses on this, right? So one is that um, there is no reason to believe that a stimulus will increase in efficacy over time. And there's good reason to believe that many stimuli reduce in efficacy over time. So I'm speaking to you right now from my office, which is also my garage, which is also my laundry room. And I have a note hanging from my camera here that says, turn off the washing machine. Because once I turn it on, it's a loud washing machine, but once I turn it on, two minutes go by and it disappears. I cease to hear it until it turns off, right? We all know this phenomenon, it, the air conditioner turns off and there's this kind of ringing hum that, that the stimulus that you've grown accustomed to goes away. So you would expect that it, uh, at least it's plausible that if we show that intervention to people over and over again, that they will return to the median instead of becoming more intensely stimulated by that. Now, now we could find out but you know, the other thing that we learned from this uh, experiment is that Facebook is the kind of company that does non-consensual psychological experiments on 60 million people at a time, which frankly disqualifies them for running a lemonade stand, let alone the social lives of 2.6 billion mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. and, and so Zuboff vests this with enormous importance, but it's, I think, the wrong importance. The importance to take away from this is that they they really believe they can do it in the same way that, you know, Bay Street is full of, you know, money managers who believe they can beat the, the, um, the market uh, indexes, which, you know, they can't, right? Like, like money managers by and large lose money relative to an index. And yet they get trillions of dollars from the smartest investors in the world. Just because a business is successful, it doesn't mean they're any good at what they're doing, even if rich people give them a lot of money to do it. Uh, and, you know, the other parts of the story that Zuboff uh, is inflamed about, I think, are kind of a double-edged sword. So you mentioned targeting. It's definitely true that if you spy on people all the time, you can make some inferences about their proclivities. Um, some are really easy to make, like people who search for refrigerator reviews are probably buying a refrigerator. Um, some are... Um, uh, easy to make because they join uh, Facebook groups called like United Racists, Racists of Alberta. <laughs> and so you can make some guesses about the political views of the people who are in that group. And um, those inferences that you make through tracking allow for a fine grain targeting. Targeting is not really persuasion. Targeting is a way to efficiently reach communities or groups that are otherwise not arrayed efficiently. So refrigerator buying is a really good example of this. The median person replaces their major appliances once or fewer in their life. It's very hard to be a refrigerator salesperson because you have this tiny window in the life of a consumer 
where they're in the market for a fridge and you have to get your marketing message to them right then because they're going to forget about the fridge messages you show them beforehand. And so, you know, up until now, the major way in which refrigerator ads took place was like, you buy a giant billboard by, you know, Pearson on the grounds that if you can afford a plane ticket, you have money and refrigerators cost money. So maybe you're going to buy a fridge. And, and that's obviously hugely inefficient, right? It has a conversion rate of like 0.0000000001%. And so now you can just like take everyone who's mentioned the word refrigerator, search for refrigerator ads, search for kitchen remodeling services. It's still going to be like 0.0001%, right? It's still going to be an infinitesimal fraction of your ad budget that actually lands on someone who's even thinking about buying a fridge. But it's so much better than the alternative that, that um, advertisers are willing to pay for it. That doesn't tell you that it's persuasive. It just tells you that it's more efficient than ads on the 401. Where this gets really interesting is where you have communities that are trying to coalesce around widely dispersed, hard to locate views, particularly socially disfavored views. Um, if you are waking up in your skin one day and thinking, gender just doesn't feel like a binary to me. I don't even know what that means, but I know it's, it's my truth. You can, with a few search terms, find people who know the words for what you're feeling. You can make common cause with them. You can build a community. You can mm -hmm. extend that community out to find allies. Those allies can then it, it evince these big normative shifts that, that can then translate into policy shifts, economic shifts, non-discrimination law, all kinds of things, new branches of medicine, reconsideration of the DSM. But that's also true if you have a, a socially disfavored view that you don't want to speak aloud because you know that if you um, admit to your neighbors that you're a racist who thinks that the color of your skin is genetically linked to your ability for self-governance and that the darker it is, the more you need to be ruled over by people who have less pigment, then you can find other people who hold this weird belief and you don't have to shout it from the roots, rooftops to make common cause. That also emerges, right, from this. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that we are living in a period of accelerated movement from the periphery to the center of our political discourse and that the internet and targeting and, uh, and, and um, social media are at the center of it. But, you know, in the same way that I think people are skeptical when you hear, for example, social conservatives say, the only reason my kid thinks that they're gay is because they saw messages saying it was okay to be gay. And instead, you know, we think that the, that the explanation for why your kid thinks they're gay is they were always gay and they didn't know the words for it until they got on the internet. It may be that there are people who were racist all along who just didn't know how to talk about it without sounding like a, a kook and getting socially isolated and they found the community that lets them do that that's a problem but it's a very different kind of problem from being algorithmically radicalized into eugenics yeah well i i think what you're talking about there is a the difference between persuasion and influencing of behavior you've talked about these shifts major shifts mm -hmm. and um, it seems to me that those that you can influence behavior on a on various scales through these various techniques even if you haven't actually changed people's minds about um, their beliefs but rather you've enabled them to get together and and coalesce um, actively but let, let's go back to your to your meteor um, and uh, so you, you're suggesting that um, the the problem is size of monopoly. You talk a lot about that in, in your book. And um, your principal prescription is um, antitrust, of breaking them up. And um, uh, uh, you, 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 you end your, your book by saying, make big tech small again. And um, so there's a lot of questions that come out of, about that. Um, uh, maybe you could say uh, a bit more about um, you know, what that would actually mean. Would we lose the services um, that these giants have created for us? I mean, in some ways they've become public infrastructure. 
Um, and um, we've seen this, you know, in the history of, of other, you know, transportation and communication infrastructures and health infrastructures and so on. Um, and that we then, um, whoever develops it, um, <laughs> needs to, it needs to be taken over and managed in a, in a different way. And it seems to me that part of the problem with, with an antitrust approach is you've just created lots of little techs that will all be furiously competing with each other. And the problem might be the, the ecosystem of this, um, you know, this, you know, for this mad uh, collection of all of our scraps of our lives, wherever they may be, and of monetizing that in ways that um, don't actually uh, address <laughs> the, the problem. Um, a lot of that can be done with um, without having the, the giants once the industry has been created. Um, so what do you say, say to that? Do you, how far do you think antitrust will take you and what are its limits? I mean, antitrust alone is a big thing and, right. and it needs to be done, right? It's so not so I, easy. I, 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 yeah, I want to go through the, the antitrust story here. I think that's, this is a good place to, to insert it. So that when we talk about influencing behavior, that's the, that's the place to start when we talk about antitrust. Because the reason I care about antitrust, the reason I care about, about uh, diffusing power is not because it makes markets efficient. I'm kind of neutral on whether it makes market markets efficient. As you say, there are lots of things that aren't efficiently managed within markets and need to be in under public ownership or some other model. And they provide mm -hmm. really useful and important services. You know, speaking as someone living under private healthcare right now, I, I can tell you that the, it's wildly inefficient um, relative to the public system that Canadians enjoy. Um, but what I care about is self-determination. Uh, the fact is that it's not just that Mark Zuckerberg is wildly unsuited to being the like czar of the social lives of 2.6 billion people. It's that that's a job no one should have. You know, yeah. the, the idea that if only we hold Facebook accountable for bad things that happen on Facebook, they will someday make the three ring binder of moderation policy so complete that um, it will encompass all possible social relations and never get it wrong and particularly not get it wrong uh, in a way that, that disproportionately disfavors marginalized people whose modes of discourse are most likely to be excluded from the discussion when they're writing the three ring binder and whose ability to raise attention when they are excluded uh, are most compromised, right? Who don't have a big platform where they can go and shout about how they're being censored or canceled or whatever. That, that, that's the real problem. And if we care about self-determination, then we can make a ranked ordered list of our ability to determine our digital lives. And at the top of it are the biggest companies that exercise the most control. So Zuboff, for example, says, well, markets generally produce optimal outcomes. Apple uh, charges money for everything, therefore it's a market, therefore it's giving us the most self-determination. But you know, Apple oh, no. uh, operates something you might call the feudal security model. Bruce Schneier calls it this. And, and actually it's, it's spread across all the tech platforms where you have, the, um, you have this world of the internet that is a very dangerous place and there are bandits afoot, right? There are people who will take control of your pipeline and ransomware it. And then um, you have these fortresses that have been built by warlords. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Tim Cook and, and Sundar Pinchai have built us these very sturdy fortresses. And if we surrender all right to self-determination and move into their fortress, they will defend us against bandits unless the bandits offer them a better deal, right? So this week, the New York Times published a thing saying, Apple lets the Chinese government see all the data that Chinese users uh, uh, have in Apple's cloud and all their messages. And we know that, you know, there are a million people in concentration camps in Xinjiang province because of their beliefs, right? So this is, this is a very uh, dangerous situation because if you're inside the warlord's fortress and if it is truly sturdy enough to keep the bandits out, then it is sturdy enough to keep you in if you decide that you, that you don't like the deal. So, you know, the fact that you can't install an app of your own choosing on an, on an iOS device uh, is great to the extent that Apple makes good choices about apps. But if you live in China and Apple has removed all apps that have working cryptography, 
then it cuts against you. It cuts against self-determination. And so self-determination is at the core here. And you know, the way that we express self-determination is not just as individuals, but as a demos, as, as a political force that subjects firms to democratic regulation. And in theory, we could imagine that we could draft good regulation about monopolies, that we could impose what, what the antitrust wonks call um, conduct remedies on them. And you see this, the, the Competition and Markets Authority in the UK and the Digital Markets and Digital Services Act in the EU contemplate versions of this. They say things like, well, Google is this like vertical monopoly. They have like a shopping site and a video site and a search engine, and we're just gonna ban them from self-preferencing. So if you search for where can I buy a widget and Google shows you a Google shopping ad or a Google shopping listing at the top of the listing, it has to be there because objectively it's the best link. There's a problem here, which is that without ready access to Plato's cave, we don't know what the objective best link is, right? Google can make a case, hey, there's no one in the world who knows more about what Google search order should be than Google. And we have determined in a completely neutral and non-self-preferencing way that the absolute best thing that we could do is to show you a bunch of ads that make us richer, right? And that, that's, that's for your own good. We actually would prefer to be more open, but gosh darn it, our competition just isn't as good as we are, right? So, so that, that conduct remedy tends to fall apart and it falls apart for a couple of reasons. The first is that monopolists uh, extract what are called monopoly rents. The, the, the reason that firms like to uh, gobble up their, their small rivals is because if you don't have to compete, you can, you can extract a larger margin, both from your suppliers. So uh, there are lots of both small and large ways that this happens. Um, you know, whenever anyone talks about the ad market share, someone inevitably points out that Amazon has this huge ad market share. Why have I suddenly gone all white there? That's weird. Um, Amazon has this huge ad market share. A that is so weird. Hang on. Let's see. I'll sit over here and be out of the random. Maybe, I, maybe I'm so excited that I've just um, spittle flecked my actual camera. Gosh, that's <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, Amazon has- Unfortunately, it's COVID immune at this point. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm fully, today's my immunity day. So Amazon has this huge ad market share. But the only thing that Amazon sells ads for is being the top listing on Amazon. So okay. if you're in, like, when they say Amazon makes X billion dollars a year on ads, what they mean is Amazon extracts X billion dollars a year from its own suppliers in bribes to get preferential treatment in search results. That is like a super weird version of an ad market. That's not what we think of when we think of ad markets. So it can extract it. You can, when you have a monopoly, right? You can extract large sums of yeah. money from your suppliers. Uh, also, um, Apple, Google, Pixar, and a bunch of other tech companies, Intel, settled a, a massive lawsuit because they all got together to agree not to poach each other's employees as a way of suppressing wages, right? That's another way you can squeeze your suppliers. And you can raise prices. Um, one of the things that we see mm -hmm. whenever we look very closely at the ad duopoly, because really Amazon is not an advertising marketplace, but Facebook and Google are. When you look at the ad duopoly, you see that they price gouge advertisers. They do it in lots of ways, both subtle and mm -hmm. uh, overt. And, and so you can raise prices, you can squeeze suppliers, and you can extract these monopoly rents. So now you have this huge pile of treasure that you've amassed because you're a monopolist. But there's something else that you can do with your, when you're a monopolist, which is you can agree with the other monopolists about how to spend the treasure. Because if there's hundreds of people in an industry running an industry, there's always going to be people who don't agree with the rest of the people. You know, the, the FBI was just forced to publish Larry Flint, the publisher of Hustler's uh, FBI file. And among other things, it shows that he plotted to assassinate Hugh Hefner. Right. If the industry is big enough, there's always going to be people who won't sit at the table with you and decide on your lobbying priorities. But once you're down to like four companies, five companies, two companies in the ad duopoly, it's really easy for them to collude. Facebook and Google colluded to fix prices that just came out from the Texas Attorney General's lawsuit on them. And, you know, you look at that picture of all the tech leaders around the the leatherette boardroom table at the top of Trump Tower in 2017. And you, your first instinct might be, oh my God, how can these bastions of sort of cosmopolitan liberalism meet with Donald Trump? 
But really what you should be saying is like, how is it that these people who run so much of our lives fit around one table? Because if you fit around one yeah. table, you can agree. You yeah. don't even have to sit around a table. Because when the industry is down to three firms, five firms, two firms, everybody knows everybody else. They all started in the same companies. They came up together. Sheryl Sandberg went from Google to becoming uh, Facebook COO. They're each other's kids, godparents. They're executors of each other's wills. You know, you don't need an explicit collusion to emerge a, a collusive prospect. And so what you end up with is these heavily concentrated industries that have enormous power because of their money, and they have the ability to spend the money to distort policy. And that means that all the things that we might do to conduct, uh, to impose conduct remedies on them are uh, rebuffed by this concentrated power and money. Um, uh, an example of this from, I believe, 2018 was in West Virginia, where despite all the talk about coal miners, the actual largest industry is chemical processing. And because chemical processing is monopolized, just like every other industry, and that's important, we need to come back to that. Um, Dow Chemical runs the chemical industry in in West Virginia. If, if you hear from the Chemical Industry Association, you're just hearing from Dow Chemical. And the state legislature investigated the question, should we have a lower standard against emissions of chemical effluent, chemical processing effluent in our drinking water supply, in the water table? Which, you know, that's, a, that's an important technical question. You know, the, the answer probably of how much effluent the water supply can absorb probably isn't zero. If you use plastic, you, you want there to be a, a good evidence-led number, not one that's so strict that you, the plastic is more expensive than you can afford and not so lax that you end up dying of, of poison. So the, the answer that the um, uh, chemical processing industry, the Dow Chemical, put into the docket was that uh, although the EPA sets a relatively strict national limit for how much poison you can put in drinking water. Here in West Virginia, we are much fatter than the rest of the country. And we can absorb more poison in our tissues before we get sick. And the legislature gave them the variance on that basis, right? So monopolies distort policy. So we have monopolies yeah. cr cross-sectorally. I'll, I'll wrap this up now. We have yeah. monopolies cross-sectorally. The remedies for monopolies are to demonopolize. But not every industry has the same path to demonopolization. And tech has a very specific path to demonopolization in the form of interoperability, which is an intermediate step between breakups or conduct remedies and, and something else. And, and uh, I hope that that can be like the next turn that we move to is how interoperability plays a role in weakening the monopoly power of tech giants that it doesn't play in any other sector, even sectors that tend towards natural monopolies like railroads. Yeah. Well, uh, I think you've persuaded us on the dangers of, of, of monopoly. Um, and what I'm interested in exploring is what happens, say you succeed um, uh, in busting them up, uh, breaking up the, the meteor and, um, and will that, because, my understanding of antitrust is that it, it is still within the commercial realm. It doesn't say anything about other business models that might be valuable for addressing needs. So mm -hmm. um, you, you talked to, um, about uh, sort of the, the demos. What, what does the, what would, if, the, if the demos, if we collectively thought about what kind of tech industry do we want, having seen what it can produce in terms of, of, of services and as also the, the, the risks. What would that look like? Would that be s simply a busted up, you know, hmm. decentralized commercial market where, where there's still the incentive um, from a surveillance capitalist um, point of view of, of capturing, you know, you know wrangling, um, trafficking in, in you know, enormous quantities of, of personal information for the purposes of, of monetizing it. And yeah. that seems to me that would, that would still exist and that would still be a problem. So you wouldn't actually be destroying hmm. surveillance capitalism um, and that we need to think of other business models um, or not just business models, but sort of economic models for how we, we direct our technological trajectories and who they serve and, and who gets to say about that. 
So I think that one way to restate what you what you describe when you talk about the business models of the current firms is that they're only profitable because of forbearance as to the harms they commit, right? That if, if you had to capture the harms that arise from abusing our privacy, the, the small gains that you eke out from spying on us would be eclipsed by the harms that that produces. And some of those are very tangible harms, like identity theft harms that are really significant. We just had our second in the US, our second credit bureau uh, breach, uh, where we've now had uh, two of them uh, uh, dump all of the PII on every American. That's personal identifiable personal information. identifying information, right? And this can be bootstrapped to steal all the money from your bank account because you can call up and answer all the questions that they need. It can be used to um, break into your email and steal all the love notes that you've sent to your lover and publish them on the internet. I mean, we see this done over and over again, just to even the the kind of brute force uh, attack of credential stuffing where you take leaked passwords and usernames and just try them on other sites on the off chance that the user had created another site with the same username and password has produced some really ghastly outcomes, including ransomware uh, hijackings, but also um, those ring doorbell cameras that people unwisely buy and then sometimes even put in their homes like in their kids' rooms, uh, as well as Google's Nest uh, cameras uh, turned out to both be vulnerable to credential stuffing attacks and you had people being terrorized and harassed. You had children who had a nursery camera having uh, strangers scream obscenities at them through it. Right? So these are real harms. And if we forced firms to uh, internalize these harms, right? if we said to them, all right, you figured out how to really cheaply collect a lot of oily rags, right? this, this exhaust process from our, from our daily round, but we're going to send you the bill every time they catch fire then the oily rag business would be a lot less profitable. And so the, the question for me is not, how do we uh, imagine other business models say? It's how do we expose the lie of this business model? Because the only reason this is the business model we indulge in is because all of the profits are uh, privatized and all of the costs are socialized. Now, right. in general, if we want to have good regulation, firms have to be small. When firms are very large, they become both like socially important or structurally important to a nation. So nations tend to exercise forbearance in respect of them. And, and also they have all this dry powder. They have all this power to, to lobby. You know, look at the texts that came out last week of David Cameron simping for Lex Greensill and his um, uh, reverse factoring business that ran up billions of dollars in uh, unsecured credit that that took down huge swaths of the economy when it burst, right? Th those, those, that's what you get when you have very large, structurally large firms. They're just big mm -hmm. piles of oily rags. So, uh, you know, an example of this from my town here, I live in Burbank, which is a small town on the outside of, of LA, like uh, sort of like North York. And um, uh, we have one business locally that's run by crazy anti-mask, anti-vax COVID deniers. It's a bar called uh, uh, Tinhorn Flats that we all call tinfoil hats. And they reopened the bar over and over again for indoor maskless dining. They created a peaceful protest area out front where people could stand on the main drag without masks and cough on passersby. And the city <laughs> decided to shut them down, right? And Burbank is not a big, powerful city. It's 100,000 people. So first they changed the locks and the owners remove the locks, right? And then they put plywood over the doors and the owners remove the plywood. And then they put sandbags on the doors and the owner kept getting arrested for removing a sandbag. They cut off the power, the owner brought generators. Finally, they put a 20 foot chain link fence around this business. It is an extraordinary thing to see. It's right there in the middle of our main drag with a chain link fence all around it. And the owner gave up, right? Because small firms for better or for worse have a hard time resisting state authority. But when the Politburo uh, uh, or when, when um, the FBI rather went to Apple and said, you know, we demand that you backdoor your phone, Apple was able to say no, right? They're powerful. I, I happen to like that they had their users back at that point. It, it was, it, it's great when the warlord is on the same side as the people inside their fortress. But, you know, then along came the Politburo and they suborned Apple. It, because they, they could hold something over Apple's head that the FBI couldn't, which was access to manufacturing in the Pearl River Delta in Shenzhen and Guangzhou, which Apple can't exist without. So if we want firms to be tractable, 
to democratic control. If we want them, for example, to allow the small scrappy co-op that you and your grad students pull together that allows you to have a private place to talk about rare diseases rather than Facebook, which aggressively courted people with rare diseases and now exposes them to privacy violations because it's too hard for everyone to collectively decide to leave all at once. And you want to make a little rare disease community that buds off of Facebook, but exchanges messages with Facebook. And as users drift off Facebook and onto your little user co-op, uh, it changes the footer on those messages. So it says now 51% of your community has left Facebook. Once we reach 70%, we're severing the tie. And so if you want to stay in this community, you have to get an account over here, click this link. If you wanted to do that with your user co-op and you wanted to either force Facebook to do it, do that or deprive them of the legal remedies that they would use to sue you if you tried to do it without their permission, you have to make Facebook small enough that they don't have the power to block that kind of alternative business model. You also have to deprive them of the money that they use to acquire everyone who tries to do something different, right? Like WhatsApp, which is a business that said, we don't sell your data, we don't spy on you, we charge a dollar a month, we're wildly successful. Facebook had a, uh, an app at that point that they bought another anti-competitive acquisition, an app called Onavo, that uh, pretended to be a battery monitor. And it would monitor your battery on your phone, but what it actually did was spy on everything you did with your phone. And by using Onavo, they discovered that both WhatsApp and Instagram were acquiring Facebook users who were leaving Facebook. They were able to spy on how they use them. They were able to acquire both firms. And then they were able to crush all of their competitors. Like with Instagram, they were able to see which Snapchat features were popular on people who had Onavo installed on their phone and integrate them into, into WhatsApp or into Instagram rather. So if, if you want to have uh, um, a place where either non-market actors or market actors or a mix of actors can enter the industry without being bought up, uh, predatorily priced out of existence, blocked through interoperability, uh, or otherwise crushed before they can gain a toehold, then you need to make the companies less powerful. Absolutely. And um, interoperability is one of the escape routes, um, an important one, no, no, no question about that. Um, uh, we're just getting to the end here. I'd just like to um, ask you about the limits of, of, of regulation and its relation to self-help me measures, because um, uh, there, it, in many ways, it seems to me that there is a, a you know, while well, you're calling for, for, um, for antitrust is a, certainly a powerful regulatory tool. Uh, another would be around data protection and Canada is currently going through considering, uh, you know, updating its um, privacy regulation. It does, from my point of view, it doesn't at this point, uh, the draft legislation doesn't actually address the surveillance capitalist business model. It, it, it eludes it because of, of um, the, the rather um, outdated way in which it tries to deal with 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 with, with data but um, I guess particularly uh, Canadians more than 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 Americans uh, look to the government and look to the to regulation as um, how you deal with this stuff um, but there are limits to that too and um, you know you talked about self-determination and you again um, mentioned that uh, it's about the the, the demos uh, sort of we together um, in some sort of organized um, self-help fashion um, need to play an active part. And that's where, you know, the interoperability can, can come in. Um, so you don't rely exclusively on the, on regulators to manage all aspects. So you need the regulator to force interoperability. Um, and that's one, you know, nascent feature in the new legislation that would require that it's, it's not well developed at this point, but, um, Thinking about sort of more community-based alternatives um, and uh, what what self-help organizations can do, not just to take on the the, the services um, that the big tech offers now, but uh, to explore a wider range of things that you can do with digital technologies that are being foreclosed by not only the sort of the monopoly of attention and money and political power, but the also a monopolization of the imagination of what we think can be done. So yeah. what, what, do you, what do you have to say to that? Sure. 
Yeah, I mean, interoperability is a really interesting uh, area to stick in the mix here, because when we talk about monopolies, not in all cases, but in many cases, we talk about something called the network effect. And, and uh, yeah. a business has a network effect if it gets better, the more people use it, right? If it, if it gets more important, the more people use it. So that's definitely true, you know, of app stores. The more users there are, the more reason there is for software developers to make apps. The more apps there are, the more reasons there are for there to be users. And you get these reinforcing, accelerating flywheels. Um, the same is true of Facebook, right? Y you may not want to be on Facebook because you don't like it, but you do like your friends and your friends are all on Facebook and they don't like it either. But figuring out how to get everybody to leave Facebook at once is really hard. And so you join Facebook. So that's a reason that someone else joins Facebook. And then they're the reason that some yet a third person joins Facebook. And you're all stuck in this kind of network effect finger trap, Chinese finger trap, where you can't escape. But network effects are only important in as much as they come with high switching costs. So look at a, a network effect uh, where there were very high switching costs because of low interoperability. When the Australian states were founded before they confederated in a, in a process very similar to Canadian Confederation, um, each state was autonomous. Each state had a would-be robber baron or would-be rail baron. They all laid their own railroad track at a different gauge. They call it the multi-gauge muddle, right? They had no CPR project, right? And so as a result, 150 years later, you still can't get a rail car from one side of Australia to the other. 300 designs have been tried to build a rail car that can drop one set of wheels and retract a set of wheels and hop over onto a new set of rails. They can't, right? They're just, they're just tearing up thousands of kilometers of rail now and building new rail. Now, if that was a software object, it's a piece of piss. You just write a little interoperability layer. There's only six states. There's six rail gauges. Like, how hard is it to write a little emulator layer for six file formats and six applications so that they can all talk to each other. I mean, that's what happens when you click on save as in Word and it drops down 700 different file formats it supports. That's just someone having written all those libraries. So there is this intrinsic power of interoperability that's built into digital. And it comes out of the deep theoretical nature of the computer, of the universal computer, the Turing complete computer that can run all programs that can be expressed in symbolic logic. Right. This has been a source of great mischief in policy circles. There have been a lot of uh, policy fights over the last 20 years where a regulator has said, I demand that you make a computer that can run every program except for one that makes me angry. And computer scientists have had to explain in very small words that we just know how to make the computer that can run all the programs, not the one that can run all the programs except for the one that terrorists or pirates or pornographers or whatever use. We just, we just know how to make one computer. And so that deep interoperability allows you to lower the switching costs. And when Zuckerberg started Facebook, it was for academics only, it was a university project, but then one day he decided to open it up to the whole world. And he had a huge problem at that moment, which was that everybody who wanted to use social media already had an account on MySpace. And MySpace was owned by this rapacious Australian billionaire, right? The, the latter day descendant of one of those rail barons who laid their own gauge. And he wasn't going to let, Rupert Murdoch wasn't going to let people leave MySpace for Facebook. And Zuckerberg did not try to organize international Everybody Quits MySpace Day, where next Wednesday at 11 o'clock, we all leave and show up on Facebook and reconstruct our social graphs. And we've all come to a better land, like, like pilgrims sailing away from, from England, right? Instead, what he did was he created a low switching cost alternative, which was a bot. And if you gave the bot your login and password, go off to MySpace, log in pretending to be you, get all the messages waiting for you, stick them in your MySpace inbox. You could reply to them. It would take them and it would push them back out to your MySpace friends. And so you could have one foot on either side, right? You could be like I am. I, I left Canada. I moved to the UK. Now I'm in the US. I still talk to my family. I brought all my stuff with me. You can see it all around me. And not like my grandmother, who was a Soviet refugee who came to Canada in the 40s, left behind everything she owned and lost touch with her family for 10 years. Like the reason the rest of her family didn't come over is that was too high a price. And so she had to go it alone. So when you lower the switching costs, the fact that there's a high network effect becomes not only unimportant, it can become a double-edged sword, right? So like think of when uh, Apple was about to be crushed by Microsoft in the early 2000s because Microsoft had a stranglehold on Office document file formats through Microsoft Office. I ran a Mac shop in those days. And I can tell you that the Microsoft version of Office for the Mac was absolutely cursed. And that if you like were dumb enough to open a document in Word for the Mac and save it again, no one, not even you, would ever be able to read that document again. 
Steve Jobs did not go on bent knee to, to uh, Bill Gates and say, please fix your janky software. He just made iWork Suite, Pages, Keynote, Calc, where the, or numbers rather, where they reverse engineered the file formats and they made programs that could read and write every Microsoft Office document ever created. And then they ran these switch ads. And the subtext of the switch ad was that now that we have an Office Suite that interoperates fully with Microsoft's Office Suite, where we're not dependent on the largesse of Microsoft to keep a competitor afloat, every Microsoft Word document in the world is a reason to buy a Mac. And so now, instead of being a walled garden, all of those Microsoft users were an all-you-can-eat buffet for, for Apple, who could just go and scoop them all up and drop them into the Apple walled garden instead. So if we can reduce switching costs by imposing interoperability, we can get beyond uh, this like binary where either we break the companies up or we don't, and we can have an interim state in which we siphon off all their most valuable lines of business, either into cooperatives, small firms, uh, state-run firms, or, or other hybrid forms. But I'm concerned that a, a mandate can't be enough, and there's mandates contemplated in the US under the Access Act, the Competition and Markets Authority in the UK, the European uh, Digital Markets uh, Act, all, all contemplate forms of mandate. The problem with mandates is they're not sturdy. They're really easy to subvert. So when the Massachusetts voters voted a right to repair bill for cars that forced the automotive makers to give them the, the codes to fix a car, uh, the um, uh, automakers responded by moving the messages from the wired network in the car to the wireless network in the car. And the wireless network wasn't covered under the, under the bill. And so seven, eight years later, they finally repaired the bill to put wireless networks under the, uh, under the remit of the bill. But in the meantime, there was like eight years where independent mechanics were going out of business and having to go to work for the big monopolistic car makers, right? And that, that just cleared the decks of potential competitors. So in addition to interop that's mandated, I want to have what you refer to as self-help interop, which is to take away the thicket of laws that Microsoft, Apple, uh, Google, and other large firms have developed in the years since they were founded that would prohibit other people from doing to them what they all did in their early days. Like if you were to reverse engineer iTunes and make a compatible program that could read and write its files, Apple would use uh, anti-hacking laws, copyright laws, anti-circumvention laws, trade secrecy laws, and so on to sue you into a radioactive crater for doing exactly the same thing to them that they had done to Microsoft. Yeah. If we can restore that adversarial interoperability, I think we can create a world where we get the best of both worlds. Okay, Corey, uh, we could obviously go on at, at great length, <laughs> but I'd like to uh, um, bring in um, some questions from the people who've been listening so patiently. We haven't even got to the, 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 uh, the, uh, your, your, the subtitle of how to seize um, the means of production, of, of computation, sorry, um, but maybe that can come up in the questions. So, so Angie, um, can uh, you give us um, uh, the first question? Uh, yeah, I can. Uh, and we have quite a few, um, but I do want to remind people also the Q&A button is available if they have a question. Uh, the first question is from Howard. Howard asks, uh, says there are, all, there are alternative search engines to Google, including DuckDuckGo and Million Short. Google can be avoided if you can live without YouTube. How do you break up Facebook and maintain that functionality? So I, I, I think that the question uh, is factually untrue. Um, you t if you look at how uh, Google um, maintains its ad dominance, it's because it is number two in the display ad market through YouTube. Uh, and that is absolutely critical to, to Google having things like the billions of dollars it needs to bribe Apple to be the default search option on, Saf on Safari and on iOS devices. Um, what's more, Google really can't be avoided on the web. Uh, almost every website that you visit has a Google font or Google Analytics or Google authentication, or it uses Google's feed burner to create its RSS feeds or what have you. And even if you can avoid all of that, Google buys a lot of third-party data sources. So Google compiles data sources uh, on you that it merges with the dossier of whatever information and traces you've already left. That's also true of Facebook, by the way. Uh, they, they're both engaged in very similar practices to say nothing of the SDKs that they make 
that exfiltrate an enormous amount of data out of apps that have no overt connection to Facebook or Google. Consumer Reports just did a big research report on the, uh, or no, it wasn't Consumer Reports. It was an independent security research firm did a report on um, all of the ad tech firms whose free SDKs were used to build all of the educational apps that have become so critical during the lockdown. And that your kid, just by using an app that doesn't have the word Google or Facebook anywhere on it, and that doesn't interact with Google or Facebook in any explicit way, that because it was built with free Facebook and Google tools, is gathering data and transmitting data about your kid. And it's actually illegal under, under the Child Online Protection Act here in the US. Uh, but it's still happening. So you, you can't really avoid either of them. Um, as to how you get Facebook's uh, full suite, well, Facebook aggregates a bunch of things that it doesn't need to aggregate. There's nothing, you know, no one came down off a mountain with two stone tablets and said Facebook Marketplace must be part of Facebook or Oculus must be part of Facebook. But if what we're talking about is the messenger and the newsfeed, um, we've, we've had lots of federated systems for messengers and newsfeeds for a long time. Uh, even though Bell Canada had a, uh, was a, for a long time a crown corporation is now a dominant monopolist in, the, in Canada providing both local and long haul telephone service, you can federate, in fact, you do federate with lots of other phone companies, both private and state owned and, and uh, hybrid all over the world every time you make a long distance call. And that's uh, regulated by, by both law and contract. Um, there are international bodies like the ITU that set up rules and so on. So conceptually, there's no reason you can't be in touch with your Facebook friends if you're not on Facebook. Uh, the main reason you can't be in touch with your Facebook friends if you're not on Facebook is Facebook makes it impossible to do to Facebook what Facebook did to MySpace. Okay, Angie, um, next question. Uh yeah, the next one is from uh, Christoph, and Christoph uh, asks, since you emphasize the size and associated power of companies, how could you suggest that future regulation by, for example, the United States or EU should work on a practical level? Should companies be split up once they reach a certain market share, employee count, revenue, et cetera? Or what should the letter of the law look like? So I think the letter of the law is actually already pretty clear, at least in, in some jurisdictions. European law particularly is pretty good on this, but surprisingly so is US law. There's, there's four major US antitrust laws and on their face, they all say things like companies aren't allowed to buy their nascent competitors. Companies aren't allowed to um, merge with uh, large competitors. Uh, and, and what happened was that 40 years ago, there was a transformation in how those laws were interpreted, not what the laws say, but what judges believe they mean. And that was a very deliberate project. There's a guy called Robert Bork, who if you've heard of him in Canada, you might know him as the guy that Reagan tried to put up for a Supreme Court seat, but the Senate rejected because he had been Nixon's solicitor general and had overseen all of Nixon's most ghastly crimes. And Bork was part of the Chicago Economic School, the, the kind of architects of neoliberalism. And he evolved this theory. It was kind of like early QAnon where he said that if you read the legislative history and the plain language of these bills very closely, like very closely, like maybe every third word and then you reverse the meaning of every second word or whatever, you will find that they mean the opposite of what they say. That uh, people like Senator Sherman of the Sherman Act, they weren't concerned with monopolies at all. They thought monopolies were great. They thought monopolies were efficient and that the only monopolies that the law should trouble itself with were monopolies that harmed consumer welfare. And they defined consumer welfare pretty narrowly in terms of uh, prices going up. And so this moved um, monopoly from a political question, do we want to allow power to be amassed into a small number of hands, and into an empirical economic one. And the empirical basis for assessing, will these two firms merger raise prices, was to build these very abstruse technical mathematical models that were invented at the University of Chicago and that only proponents of monopoly knew how to build. And so if you were uh, proposing a merger between two large firms, if you were like Telus and Rogers about to merge, you would go to the University of Chicago and you would pay one of their economists to build a model. And then the model would, by an incredible coincidence, always say that things would be fine. And then if after you merged, the prices went up, your opponents would come up and say, well, you have merged a monopoly and you've raised prices. We have a consumer welfare harm. And you could pay an economist from the University of Chicago to build another model. 
that would say, actually, the prices went up because of an exogenous factor. It's labor, it's energy costs, the moon is in Venus, and it has nothing to do with the fact that one company makes all this stuff now. That's not why the prices went up. So they set themselves up as a kind of a priesthood. And whenever the king wanted to make a choice, the priest would drag in a goat, slaughter it, read the future in its guts. And if any of the courtiers said, I don't see that thing that you just identified in that goat's guts that you claim is there, they would sort of look around and go, look who thinks he can read a goat's guts, huh? And, and so we can recover a more muscular form of antitrust, right? One that, that looks on mergers with great skepticism, that um, uh, breaks up uh, firms that have undertaken mergers that turned out to be anti-competitive, like as the very low hangingest of all the low hanging fruit, any company that made a promise when it merged that then broke the promise should have to unmerge. So Facebook promised they would never mine Instagram and combine the profiles with Facebook. And they did break them up, right? Like if you, if you, if you promise, if you obtain consent by making a promise and then you don't live up to your promise, then the consent is withdrawn. And, you know, Facebook's argument for why this shouldn't happen is it would be very expensive and difficult. And that's the exact reason you do want it to happen, because you want companies to know that if they cheat, if they lie to obtain a merger, then the pain is unbounded so that, you know, if the next company that comes along will have their example to live through. You know, as Camus said, sometimes you got to execute an admiral to encourage the others, right? So that's like super low hanging fruit, block mergers, break up uh, mergers undertaken on false pretenses. Google said it would never merge the back ends of YouTube and, and uh, its main search product and its ad tech stack, break them up, right? Uh, uh, that seems to me to be like a, a pretty easy way to get there. And in particular, it's very easy in Europe because Europe never adopted consumer welfare in statute or in interpretation. They just had it kind of rammed down their throat by the US trade rep and by people who went overseas to get educated. Same with the UK. Um, but you know, this ideology was very popular among European politicians like Margaret Thatcher and Helmut Kohl. It was very popular with Brian Mulroney and it was very popular with Ronald Reagan and it became the law of the land. And for 40 years, one lawmaker and administration after another has only expanded its doctrine. It's time to abandon the doctrine. The doctrine has failed. Yeah. Um, just uh, on that point, a, a great book um, by Tim Wu, who's now uh, part of the Biden administration on um, that model of antitrust and how it went astray and how it needs to be reformed is uh, called um, The Curse of Bigness. And we might be hearing more from Tim Wu um, uh, soon. <laughs> He's at the FTC now. We, we grew up together in North York, so it's great to see local boy make good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ange, another question. Uh, yeah, the next one, <clears throat> um, sorry, uh, is uh, somebody says, uh, you're not really struck, stuck since you can always choose not to use Facebook, Twitter, etc. cetera. Um, why complain about a service that you choose to use knowing the consequences of doing so? And like, rather than using email or creating um, message boards or, or something. Yeah, so this is real like consumer welfare style critique, right? That, that people just make choices. And, and if you don't like Walmart, shop somewhere else. Um, don't punish someone just for doing good. And the re the, it ignores the reality of network effects. Right? The, the reason people are on Facebook is that if they're off Facebook, they suffer. They suffer real material consequences. They can't be in touch with their kids' little league team, so their kid can't play. They can't access Facebook Marketplace. They can't uh, access relatives who uh, only use Facebook, who are engaged in this mutual hostage taking. Right? That's why we need to have uh, not just uh, something that stops these mergers, but we also need to lower the, the switching cost of going from Facebook to somewhere else because there are lots of people who'd like to leave, right? My whole family had the chance to get out of Leningrad at the end of the Second World War, um, but only my grandmother did it. And the reason the rest of them stayed was not because they were convinced that Stalinism was going to create a new nation that they wanted to live in. It was that the cost of leaving was too high. They, they each had too many connections to each other and coordinating a single departure was too hard. So if we lower the switching costs and you see this all the time now where, where it's actually relatively easy for people from the wealthy world to go from one country to another and it's happened. There's been a lot of it. And it's easy within Canada to move from one province to another and people do it all the time. 
if you made it much harder, if you made it much more expensive, if, for example, you had the Chinese exclusion tax of whenever it was 1867, or if you had the kind of rules that we have now that block people, unless they're so-called high skilled people from moving in from the global south, you get a lot less of it. And, and not just of people who don't qualify, but of people who do qualify under the formal characteristics, but who are worried that they'll have to leave too many other people behind. And then on top of that, there's just this fact that leaving Facebook doesn't mean you're not on Facebook anymore. Even if you leave Facebook, Facebook maintains a profile for you, they gather data on you, they do all kinds of things. And in fact, it's much harder to use privacy law to correct what Facebook holds on you, see what Facebook holds on you and contest it if you don't have a Facebook account. Because at least if you have a Facebook account, you can prove to Facebook that you're you. And if you can't, ironically, to um, invoke your own data rights over Facebook, you have to give them more information because they don't know that you're, you're you, right? That you might be an identity thief trying to steal your information to victimize you. So it th this idea of consumer choice just doesn't hold up in a monopoly, right? You, you can't shop your way out of monopoly capitalism. You know, two companies stock almost everything in your grocery aisle, uh, uh, Unilever and Procter and & Gamble. And, you know, back in the 70s and the Ralph Nader era, if you didn't like what a company was doing, you could boycott them with your friends and it might actually get them to change their behavior because they knew that there was uh, another firm you could go to. But if you go down your grocery aisle and you say, you know what? I'm not going to buy this brand of cookies because there's too much packaging. I'm going to buy the low packaging brand over here. And you look at the label. They're both made by the same company, right? That company has just figured out how to segment its market. And no amount of purchase decisions, right? No amount of thinking of your political power of springing from your status as an ambulatory wallet is going to make a difference in how that company conducts its business. You know, people did leave Facebook. Millions of people left Facebook for Instagram, and Facebook bought Instagram, right? If we want people to have choice and exercise choice, we have to fight monopoly because choice is only possible if there are choices and if it's easy to make them and if you can make them collectively with low switching costs. Good. Angie. Uh, yeah, the next question, uh, you talk about regulations. Where would you put the line when uh, the regulations should start to be implemented? How to avoid suppressing or increasing startup costs for newer companies? An example would be by mandating uh, interoperability or by controlling implementation of proprietary features. Yeah, this is a, a huge problem. And we've seen this in other regulatory contexts, like when the European Union was debating uh, copyright filters as part of the copyright directive in 2018 and 2019. You know, the, the first preference of every monopolist is not to be regulated. And their second preference is to be regulated in a way that only they can afford, right? So that they can just, rather than buying nascent competitors, it can be like those automakers in Massachusetts who just forced everyone who thought about starting a small business out of business and made them come get a job with them if they wanted to stay in their trade, right? You, you could dispense with the whole inefficient world of aqua hires and just force people to show up at your HR department asking for a job rather than starting a company first. And so uh, I, I think there is a really big worry there. Now, I don't think uh, adherence to standards is actually an expense creator. I think adherence to standards is um, something that scales pretty easily. Uh, and so mandating standards or mandating uh, an interface but not mandating the code that, that sits underneath it. So you say, well, look, you have to respond to messages that are in a, the appropriate syntax but how you do it is your own way. And by the way, here's a free and open robust library that's well-established and has lots of contributors and that you know, has been independently certified by NIST say, or, or uh, some other you know, state level cyber risk assessment entity that actually just lowers startup costs. You know, the, the early days of the Bell system in the US was characterized by the ability to control interoperators you know, the Bell system argued that they were part of the national infrastructure, that they were structurally important. And that, that meant that if you allowed third parties to, to plug things into their network, you could undermine the, the nation itself. And so they asserted this monopoly over what you could plug into the system. Uh, and so that started to crumble only when they became so obnoxious in enforcing it that even the judges who'd been very sympathetic to them were like, come on guys. So the first one was there was a company that made a thing called the hush that was a plastic cup that fit over the mouthpiece of your phone. 
so that when you talked, people couldn't read your lips or easily eavesdrop on you. And Bell argued that by clicking this plastic cup onto the receiver of the phone that they rented to you, because you couldn't buy a phone, you had to rent it from them and pay for it hundreds of times over in the life of your phone, that you were endangering the integrity of the Bell system. The court told them that, that this was a risible argument, and then the fact that there was this standard interface, that every receiver was the same shape, became not a burden that other companies had to, to face when they entered the market. You know, rather than being able to tool uh, an accessory for a phone that is of any size or shape that we want, we are constrained to fitting it on the Bell receiver, the standard Bell receiver that comes from Western Digital. Instead, that was, again, that was an all-you-can-eat smorgasbord. You know, my first computing experience was in 77. My dad brought home an acoustic coupler from OISE, from, from, from the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. And it was just this like, this pair of suction cups that you could uh, 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 drop a phone onto after you dialed the mainframe, after you dialed the PDP at the university, because the phones all had the same shape. These companies could make these acoustic couplers and sell them to every customer that had ever been a Bell customer. And so the important thing is not to say, well, do we standardize or don't we standardize? Or is there a rule or isn't there a rule? The important thing is to attend to like the technical characteristics of the rule so that what you're leaning into are rules that lower barriers to entry. And what you're leaning away from are rules that raise the barrier to entry. Like, so if the European Union, as they have done, mandates copyright filters that cost hundreds of millions of dollars, it just means that everyone except Facebook and YouTube exits the market. And so that means that now artists have only two companies they negotiate with. Those companies are already in the practice of colluding with one another. They will squeeze the artists and artists will get less money. That's not a good deal for artists. It's not a good deal for competition. It's not a good deal for, for self-determination. That's what makes it a bad regulation. Now, there are other potential regulations that we could have created that would have been extremely uh, pluralistic, right? Like we have blanket licenses already. If you want to play music in a live venue, you pay a fee. You can play any music you want. The money is uh, collected and, and they figure out what's being played and they give it out to artists. That process could be made better. It could be made fairer. But in practice, if you had a blanket license for music, it meant that if you had one user on your music service, you could access the same catalog that YouTube does. But if YouTube has a billion users, it would pay a billion times more than you did. And every time you added a user, you would just add one more license fee. And what that would mean is that anyone could enter the market that YouTube was in without facing the one non-technical, major, difficult barrier to entry, which is striking deals with every rights holder. And so, you know, that's that's the way that you could imagine solving the problem of monopsony, where creators' incomes are being squeezed by intermediaries, and it doesn't involve. Uh, creating a barrier to entry that's, that makes those creators beholden to two giant firms from another country. Okay, great. Um, Angie, um, uh, I've yeah. got plenty of questions here. So, uh, Yeah, the next question, uh, Mary o <clears throat> says, a lot of effort is going into top-down fixes, antitrust, Section 230, etc. How much will this help us if the playbook for creating addictive, toxic UX is out there and being replicated freely? Does there need to be an uh, equivalent bottom-up regulation that ensures UX standards uh, that don't just perpetuate more addictive, mindless behavior just in different places? I think that the evidence for the addictiveness of technology is mostly what they call crita hype, which is when technologists claim to be uh, geniuses, but then admit to being evil geniuses. Because if you're going to be uh, 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 a genius, then it's okay if you're evil, right? At least you're still a genius. You know, when you look at like the really so-called addictive patterns, which look more in retrospect like fads, what you see is that they come and go. Like I lived through the great Zynga epidemic where everyone I knew was playing Farmville. Zynga's basically in the toilet. It had hundreds of millions of dollars to try and replicate a pattern that people became inured to very quickly. And it never managed the trick. Now we look at things like Facebook and we say, is it addictive? Well, to the extent that everyone you love is being held hostage on Facebook and you're holding them hostage on Facebook and you wanna see the people you love, then I guess you could call it addictive. But there, that, that isn't about like bypassing your critical faculties. It's about putting a barrier between you and something that is innately human, right? It, it, it's, it's putting a barrier between you and, and your social relations that are important to you being a fully realized person, someone 
in equilibrium, someone of, of good mental health. And I, I think that that addictiveness is addressable. It's addressable with interoperability and that, you know, the, the claims of mind control, right? The claims of UX, the claims that if only we gather more data, we'll be able to do it better are, are claims that we should take with enormous skepticism and that we should say these extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. And the proof is very, very thin. You know, the idea that if you take statistical inference methodologies, which is what we call machine learning, and you add more data to them, they will become an artificial intelligence. That claim, it's like saying that if you selectively breed a horse long enough, it'll become an internal combustion engine. No one can articulate a path that goes from statistical inference to consciousness, right? It's just, it's an article of faith and it's an article of faith that's extremely self-serving. It's an article of faith evinced by people who are either trying to sell you something or raise some money. And, you know, maybe they're right. People have made weird claims in the past, you know, they, they said one day we would get all of our social relations on the internet. That was a very weird claim. It turned out to be pretty true. Um, but, you know, when people make those claims, we should ask ourselves whether the evidence is, is commensurate with the extraordinariness and the unprecedentedness of these claims. Because every persuasion technique that has been effective had a very short half-life. You know, you walk around, um, what do they call it now? The distillery district in Toronto, those old warehouses in the East End, the big, beautifully preserved brick buildings. And on the sides of them, you'll see a sign that says, pawn soap will make you clean five cents, right? Clearly at one point that sold a lot of soap, right? Today you turn on the TV and it's like, Axe love spray will make you a love God, right? Because we became inured to the message. The sound of the washing machine became back, background hum. $2.99 became indistinguishable from $3. Clearly at one point, $2.99 tricked a lot of people into not thinking $3. It doesn't work anymore. And in fact, if you've ever raised a kid, you can see them go through it because of course kids haven't yet developed these, these calluses over the soft spots in their attention and their cognition. And you can see them get sucked in. That's why like kids TV ads really matter and kids TikTok ads really matter because they don't have those critical faculties yet. Not because they're not capable of reasoning but because they haven't had the context yet. They haven't learned through experience. They don't know yet what, what uh, heuristics to apply when believing this stuff. But you know, the claims of UX designers to be able to do things to, that are that extraordinary, as opposed to just dark patterns, right? As opposed to hiding the text underneath the buy button that says purchase renews every 30 days at the cost of $300. Again, this is not persuasion, right? That's just a fraud. And the fact that like dark patterns work by like hiding things in small print doesn't mean that dark patterns will work in convincing you that up is down, left is right, and, and Facebook is where you really want to hang out with your friends as opposed to where you must hang out with your friends because they're all stuck there and you're stuck there too. Okay, Ench, I think you're ready for another question. Uh, yeah, the next one, uh, beyond the virtues of small enterprise, how might the profits of big tech be redirected toward public funding for community-based tech development? And are there good models of the latter that we could build on? So I, I um, boy, it's a whole kettle of worms, right? Because I, I don't think we need taxes to fund programs. I, I think, you know, if you actually look at how the central banks work and how tax authorities work, they don't pile up the money we pay in our taxes and then spend it on programs. Taxation takes money out of circulation and spending puts new money into circulation. Government debt's not like a household debt. It's different at the provincial and the city level because, you know, Cities can't make their own money. Provinces can't make their own money. Bank of Canada can't run out of dollars. So if we're going to fund tech development, we should just fund tech development. Yeah, it's a problem if, if the Bank of Canada spends so much money that there's more money chasing goods uh, than there are goods for, and then the price of goods will go up. We call that inflation. We can use taxation to take money out of circulation to, to fight inflation. We should tax the tech companies both for that reason and because it, lower, it lessens their political power, you know, and it makes them... Uh, less super competitive with uh, local rivals. You know, once you attain a certain threshold that allows you to uh, uh, avail yourself of exotic tax structures where, where you 
maintain the fiction that all of your transactions are being consummated somewhere over the Irish Sea or whatever, then you know your your cost structure is like 35% less than your domestic rivals because they're all paying their taxes. And so you know no one can get a foothold. Those are all good reasons to tax companies, but none of them have anything to do with how we should fund tech development. We should just fund tech development, right? We should we should have grants to make free and open source software projects uh, more robust. We should do things like structurally analyze free and open source software projects that are critical to Canadian governments, communities, and businesses, and look at the ones that only have like one or two committers and pay 20 committers to, to work on that and to staff a support line and to document it. I mean, the, the what a civic digital infrastructure looks like is actually pretty well theorized. There's a lot of people working on everything from like geolocating um, automated uh, defibrillators in communities and locating auto automated defibrillator deserts so that you can put new ones in so that you can save people of heart attacks to figuring out how to do scheduling at doctor's offices or electronic health records or whatever. Like the, the list is long. There's lots of opportunities for collaboration at the municipal, provincial and, and federal level, both within Canada and internationally. And we can and should fund it. We don't have to wait until rich people let us take their money away to do that. We knew that tomorrow. We should still take away rich people's money, right? But not because we need their money to do stuff. We can have nice things. We should have nice things today. And we should use the fact that those nice things mean that we don't all have to work our guts out and that we're all not terrified that we're going to starve to death to give us the breathing room to figure out how to make governments that are responsive so that we can blunt the power of the super wealthy so that we don't have one person whose fortune is so vast that they can shift our policies around at the expense of the decisions that we might otherwise come to as a demos, as a collective, as a, a popular and legitimate government. Wow, great. Um, Angie, do we have um, time for one more question? Uh, yeah, I can, I can ask one more question. Okay. Um, the next one is, uh, uh, Catherine says, uh, I think arguing whether our data shouldn't be collected because it can be used to manipulate us versus because it allows one company to develop the best AI and have a monopoly on AI development is not all that useful. To me, the relevant question is, is it likely to be stopped? Of course it can be stopped, but in practice, I just don't think people care enough. So will people ever decide it must be so stopped and how do you see that happening? Yeah, it's gotta be iterative you know, that we will hit a threshold tipping point where people care about um, data over collection for the same reason they care about climate change. The, the trick is that we're in a race between peak indifference and, and nihilism, because there comes a point which, you know, and when we have data conversations comes up a lot where people are like, well, it's too late, right? The, uh, so much of our data is already out there. We're never going to be able to claw it back. I guess privacy is dead. That's a a much easier thing to say if you're not in a marginalized at-risk group than if you're in a group that has you know few things to hide. But I don't think privacy is dead. Uh, I think that the pattern that we're going to have to use is is a an iterative one, where we make new services that people like that show what the internet can be like, and then we use those as the basis to assert laws that make it easier to make services like that. We use those laws to tempt investors into making new services, whether those investors are cash investors or sweat equity investors and cooperative projects. Then that um, uh, grows the, the, the case for even stricter laws, even stricter regulation, that it's, it's not going to be just one thing, right? You, you will grow the pool of people who are partisans for this one little bit at a time. And, and I'm just looking at the time here because I got another meeting to go to, but I'm going to close out by, by saying what I always say about monopolies which is that we can analogize the fight against monopolies to the fight over the environment. Uh, James Boyle at the University of, at Duke University rather, traces the, the history of the term ecology. He says, you know, before the term ecology was coined, it wasn't obvious that people who work on what we think of as environmental issues were on the same side. You know, if you cared about owls and I cared about the ozone layer, what do they have in common, right? You're, you're exercised about like charismatic nocturnal avians. And I'm exercised about the gaseous composition of the upper atmosphere. What makes us fighting on the same front? The term ecology took a thousand issues and made them into a single movement. And we're on the verge of something like this, but for monopoly, because monopolies become the dominant form of every industry. 
There's one company in the United States that makes glass bottles at scale. It's been a huge vaccine uh, bottleneck, so to speak. But there's also only one professional wrestling league. And the guy who owns it bought all the rivals. He reclassified his employees as contractors, took away their health care. And every wrestler you've ever loved is begging for pennies on GoFundMe so they can die with dignity. There's four big accounting firms that have been implicated in every major financial scandal. There's about four big banks. There's five big web firms. There's three big record labels. There's four big movie studios, three giant talent agencies. Whatever industry you care about, from athletic shoes to bras to cat food, they're all dominated by one industry. And there are people who are angry about each one of those. What they don't know is that they're all fighting the same fight. They don't know that caring about uh, athletic shoes and professional wrestling and the web are really about caring about monopoly. And if we can build a cross-sectoral movement to fight monopoly for pluralism, for self-determination, for blunting corporate power and spreading power out into many hands instead of a few corporate boardrooms, that will be the movement that we need to actually trigger real systemic political change. Well, well said. And uh, thank you so much, Corey. I uh, hope everybody joining this has found this as stimulating as I have, and also that you will uh, join us in two weeks for the next event in the Taming Big Tech series, when I'll be talking to researcher and activist Meredith Whitaker, who has an interesting history with Google and is now the director of the AI Now Institute. So thank you, Corey. Thank you, thank you. Angie. Uh, thank you all for, um, for joining us. And um, over to you, Jim. You should all come to Meredith's talk. She, I was on her board for a long time. She's great. We did a talk together for my last book tour. She's awesome. Well, listen, right. thank you. I, I mean, I can't thank you enough, Corey. That was such a stimulating discussion, conversation. Uh, I'm just uh, in awe of your ability to articulate those things and so clearly. And thank you, Andrew, for moderating that. And thank you to the audience for joining us. Um, I want to reiterate the invitation to our next event. Uh, as part of this Taming Big Tech Exploring the Alternative series, as Andrew mentioned, it's going to feature Mar Margaret Whitaker. Uh, Mer found, Meredith. I'm, well, I'm sorry, Meredith Whitaker, I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, who founded uh, Google's Open Research Group, co-founded the M-Lab, and is a Mindaroo Research Professor at NYU, and where she co is co-founder and faculty director of the AI Now Institute. And the title she's given for her session is Taking Control of Algorithms, Data, and Infrastructure. So that'll be two weeks from today uh, on June 2nd, Wednesday, June 2nd at 4 p.m. Eastern time. If you want more information about that event, uh, about any of our other events, or would like to direct any people who missed Corey's talk today, uh, it will be uploaded onto our website tomorrow. The website is CFE dot Ryerson dot CA CFE dot Ryerson dot CA. Thank you all so much for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye.